10 steps to protect your money from massive coming changes. Now, things around the world are happening fast, and if you're not paying attention, then your money and your future will be at risk. And even if you are paying attention, what can you do to protect yourself, your family, and your finances? So in this video, I'm gonna break down what is happening right now that you should be paying attention to, but you might not have realized. Why the time is coming fast, you might only have a few more months to prepare, and I'm gonna give you 10 steps to protect your money from these massive changes that are coming, so let's go. All right, welcome back. If you are new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss and I make these videos to change the way you think about money because almost everything that you have learned is wrong. I'm trying to bring context to what is happening politically, financially, and in the technological realm. Now, I'm gonna give you 10 steps of ways that you can protect yourself from changes that are coming super fast. Like I said, maybe only a few more months to be prepared. Now, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. However, I am going to do a special presentation off of YouTube, stuff I can't talk about on YouTube. There's a link down below, it's free. You can come, it's gonna be about an hour. I'm gonna go through more details on what I'm doing with my money, what I'm doing to prepare, exact assets and so forth that I'm buying and I'm gonna do a full live Q&A so you can ask me all the questions that you want um, about what I'm gonna prepare or what I'm gonna to present to you. There's a link down below, like I said, it's free, but it's in-depth, it's something that I can't cover on YouTube, so check it out, join me on this special live presentation. Okay, jumping right into it, we are talking about the 10 steps. So like I said, changes are coming really fast. It's coming so fast we can barely keep up on it. Of course, some of the news headlines you've seen, inflation, 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 inflation. There's no inflation, inflation's transitory. Now it's a big problem. Inflation rate accelerates to a 40 year high at seven and a half percent. Now of course, I've done plenty of videos as to why that's not even a true number. It's way higher than seven and a half percent, but um, that's what they're telling us. We know that the real unemployment rate is super high. They're telling us that unemployment is back down to uh, very low historical levels, except for whenever I go anywhere in my town, I see help wanted signs everywhere. As a matter of fact, lots of stores in my town are not even able to open at certain times because they don't have enough staff. So if we look back at how they used to calculate unemployment just a, two decades ago, we're at double digits unemployment. It's pretty bad. Uh, we can see that, as I've made many videos, the Fed is stuck. What are they gonna do? They c if they continue to stimulate the markets, that inflation just keeps going higher. However, if they stop stimulating the markets, then the markets crash. Either way, they're in a bad position either way. And like I said, the central banks cannot stop this. They're basically out of options. Interest rates are at zero or negative in most parts of the world. And we've created trillions of dollars and there's nowhere to go. They're damned if they do, damned if they don't. Civil unrest is at an all time high. And these are all leading up to some of the changes. Now, another part of a lot of these changes that we're having is because of this, their power is slipping. So what does that mean? So uh, if you're watching this channel, it's not coming as a surprise to you. If you're new, I apologize. You're going to you're going to go from zero to 100 miles an hour really quickly here. But basically, we have um, people that want to control the world. Uh, these are the people that go into politics. These are the people that work at the World Economic Forum. They work at the IMF and they want to control the world. They want to tell you how to live because of course you're not smart enough and they want that money, they want that control and they need that money and then they control through um, policies and through narratives, through media and that power has been slipping. Part of the reason why their power is slipping is because of this. Now I talk about this um, in my three cycles thesis. I talk about the technological revolution that's changing. I'll go ahead and link to that video right up here. But basically what's happened is whenever it, the technology changes that changes the way the world works, it changes the way that we organize. And the internet is one of those driving forces. And so they used to be able to control the people through the information that was um, available, but the internet has changed everything. Today, we're talking about the Federal Reserve. Nobody talked about the Federal Reserve 20 years ago. Today, we're talking about fiat currency. Nobody talked about fiat currency. Today, we can see every single thing that's being done, and no matter how hard they try to control the narrative through their uh, mainstream media, you know, CNN, CNBC, et cetera, they're not getting anybody to watch that. Now everybody's watching Joe Rogan and Tucker Carlson. And so the internet has completely changed that. And so for the last two years, what we've really seen is a struggle of the leaders trying to hold on to any control that they have. 
They're desperately trying to control the narrative, but they are losing control. And we can see this all over. And so, for example, Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a complete disaster. 20 years we were there, $20 trillion is gone. Where did that money go? Where did that $20 trillion go? And when we left, it was a spectacular defeat. The United States, the greatest military in the history of the world, left with their tail between their legs and literally people clinging onto the edge of airplanes trying to get out of there. And of course, the internet allowed us all to see exactly what was happening. We have the Ukraine situation going on right now where the media is telling us that, that Russia is going to invade and that the United States people have to be ready to go to war. But in Ukraine, they're like, wait a minute, we're not having any problems and Russia's not trying to uh, take us over. And so we have this internet and it's completely changed everything. Of course, we have the trucker protest that's going on in Canada right now where the mainstream media wants to tell you that they're racist and misogynist and they're there with hate. But then we have the internet that shows us that they're there peacefully and they're dancing and they're singing and they're all with Canadian flags. And so the mainstream media wants to tell you something, but they have lost the narrative. And because of this, uh, they're trying to gaslight us, but we know the difference. Here's a good one. Uh, the Fed cannot get inflation under control. They're doing anything to control inflation. Remember, if they don't stop stimulating the markets, inflation rate is higher. Uh, but here's a good idea. Why don't we blame it on Russia? Because we blame everything on Russia. Russia-Ukraine conflict could cause inflation to hit 10%, they tell us. Oh, how, how, that's pretty good. Why don't we just blame it on Russia? But their power is slipping, and so what's happened is it's caused them to try to hang on to their power with everything they have. But here is the thing. It's a race. The timing is hard, okay? Uh, it's easy to see what's going to happen. It's almost impossible to predict when it's going to happen. However, I have this crystal ball. Well, it's a picture of a crystal ball. I don't really have one. I wish I did. It would sure make it much easier if I did. Um, but I'm going to try to give you what I think is going to happen. So anyway, it's a race. It's a race between what? Well, they're losing their power very quickly. So it's a race. How fast can they set up new controls to handle that control? How fast can they get them set up before the public has woken up and gotten rid of them? That's the race right now. And so the people are waking up all over the world. The truckers in Canada are now spreading to a trucker protest happening in the United States, into Australia, into all these other areas. And so everybody is waking up to this. The internet is waking people up. And, if, and uh, we'll get into a couple of facts about this pretty quickly. And can they hang on? Well, what are some of these pieces of control that they need? So obviously, um, your health passport that you need to have on your phone to gain access to society, that's one way. If they can get you to force you to be able to check in to even gain access to society, that's one way. Another way is digital IDs. You see that all over the news are talking about it. And another way is the central bank digital currencies, which of course is something that I have talked about at length. Now I want to bring you to this. This is from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. They're kind of like the central bank above central banks. I know, I know, I know the BIS is really that. But for this purpose, the IMF sits above that. And we can see right here a few days ago, February 9th, Kristalina Georgieva, she is from the IMF. She said that uh, in this report, The Future of Money, she said that we have moved beyond conceptual discussions of central bank digital currencies. They're done discussing it. We are now in the phase of experimentation. That means they're out. They're here. They're using them. So that tool is here. Now, a lot of people have asked, and I've made the point, um, you know, let's say that uh, over the last 24 months, the Federal Reserve and the, and the government have spent about $8 trillion dollars to keep the markets from crashing. Globally, about $20 trillion to keep the markets from crashing. They obviously don't want them to crash. Why would they have spent $8 trillion or $20 trillion globally just to let them crash now? It doesn't make any sense, would it? Unless they're trying to keep them propped up until they're ready, until they're ready for a switch. And that's the premise that I've been operating on. I've talked about it many times with you. And so we know that they are almost ready when the central bank digital currencies are ready, they'll be ready to let the system crash so they can make a switch unless they're running out of time and they have to speed that up. I'm going to show you what I mean, but back to this. So the central bank digital currencies, they're almost ready. They're past talking about it. They're experimenting now. A hundred countries are exploring central bank digital currencies at one level or another. Um, we can see in China, which of course has been leading the way, uh, China's 
control over their surveillance and their technology is, of course, what the West is trying to bring everywhere else. So of course, China's leading the way with their social credit score system and their money. It says China, the digital renminbi, is uh, more than 100 million individual users, more than 100 million individual users and billions of yuan in transactions. So that's about a third of the United States in size of the people that are actually using their central bank digital currency. Just last month in January, the Federal Reserve issued a report that noted that a CBDC could fundamentally change the structure of the US financial system. Are you paying attention? I'm taking them at their word. This is not conspiracy. This is not meant to be controversial. This is what the IMF put out a few days ago. The Federal Reserve, I'm going to read it again, that their CBDC would fundamentally change the structure of the US financial system. How will it do that? Well, let's take a look. I want to play you a clip. Now, remember I said that the uh, central bank, so all the countries have central banks, and then there's a central bank above the central banks. So it's kind of the IMF, but really it's the BIS. So let's listen to a clip from the head of the BIS telling us about central bank digital currencies. Let's go ahead and give it a play. Aren't our analysis on CBDC in particular for the use of general, to the general use uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash, uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who is using a $100 bill today. We don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. Uh, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also we will have the technology to enforce that. Those, are, those two issues are extremely important and that makes a huge difference with respect to what, she, to what cash is. So there you heard it, directly from his mouth. Now remember what I tell you all the time, <laughs> I take these people at their word. That's what he said. Central bank digital currencies will be used to monitor and control every single aspect of your financial life. You see what's happening in Canada? Oh, no, nope, you can't uh, donate money to peaceful people that are, you know, doing peaceful assembly anymore. You're not allowed to do that. Oh, you give money to go, go, uh, go fund me or whatever. Oh, we'll just seize it. No problem. You see what's happening? And now in his own words, they want to use central bank digital currencies for that. Now, like I said, I was, I've been operating under this premise that I think they need to wait until the tools are ready before they can make the switch. I was thinking it's about 12 to 24 months before the central bank digital currency is ready to go. Of course, China already has theirs out. The Fed said last month they're almost ready to roll it out. I think it needs another 12 months. But what if they don't have another 12 to 24 months? What if their grip is slipping so fast they need to make a shift right now. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we can see that these uprisings, these populist uprisings are happening all over the world. They can barely hang on at this point, but there's a date coming that you need to be aware of, and this is this right here, this election. There's midterm elections coming up this year, and what happens is if they don't do something they could lose their entire grip on what's going on. Now, I don't try to turn this into left versus right, Republicans, Democrats, I don't believe in any of that. I like to believe in the individual versus the collectivist. And so, uh, in my opinion, Republicans and Democrats are both collectivists, S socialism and communism and, cap uh, and uh, communism, all those things, Republicans and Democrats are all collectivists versus the individual who just wants to be left alone, who just wants to work and provide for his family and spend time with his kids. But what we can see here is this was published 20 hours ago. Reporters Notebook, why 2022 midterms could mirror 2010 bloodbath for Democrats could get completely wiped out. We can see here, Wall Street Journal, 2022 midterms are a no win for the Democrats. They are about to get completely swept out unless they maybe do some funny business at the polls. I'm not gonna talk about that because I'll probably get my channel banned. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. And of course, if they were to do that, everybody's gonna know. And there'll be more civil unrest and more uprising, more protests, et cetera. And so 
it looks like it could all be coming to a head here before the midterm elections this year. That's how long you have to prepare. Now, let's talk about this. Um, we need to prepare now. Um, here's a couple things we need to prepare for, and then I'm going to give you 10 steps. All right, 10 things that I'm doing. Uh, we need to s prepare for big, categorically, supply chains continuing to break down. Now, they say that inflation was transitory, and now inflation's a problem, and oh, but you know, the inflation is just because the supply chains are breaking down. Okay, it's not because of the money printing. It's not because the $8 trillion dollars we dumped in. It's because of the supply chains. But why are the supply chains breaking down? They used to work fine. Well, our purchase is we're now purchasing over 20% more goods than we were before. The demand went up. Why did the demand go up? Oh, because the $8 trillion, that's right. Oh, also because of worker shortages. Why do we have worker shortages? Oh, because of the mandates that have been put into place and all the people that have been fired. You see, it is because of the money printing. It is because of the government. It is because of the central planning. Now, on top of that, we have trucker protests going on in Canada that are literally blocking the roads and the borders. And because of the NAFTA agreement, free trade between Mexico and Canada, we, if we can't get stuff back and forth across the borders, that's going to create problems. There's talks about one happening in the United States. If truckers go on protest, guess what happens? More supply chains breaking down. That's a problem you need to be aware of and you should be paying attention to. Also, we're going to have continued inflation. Uh, they can't do anything about the inflation. The Fed's stuck between a rock and a hard place. And as we can see, as I showed you earlier, they're already trying to tell us that Russia, you know, they're to blame. There's going to be inflation coming 10%. They're warning us 10% more of that. And as I said, more civil unrest. The more they squeeze, the more people are going to try and push back. The more people push back, the more they squeeze and it's just a continuing feedback loop. So let me give you 10 steps of what I'm doing. I'm going to break them down into five and five for you here. All right. So first, five steps for financial changes. All right. So here's five steps for your financial. Then we're going to five steps for your personal. All right. So one, what are we going to do with our money? So if the supply chains are breaking down, the stock market's going to crash, the Fed's going to continue to push inflation. What do we do with our money? How do we protect ourselves financially? Well, the first thing is we need to have assets that go up with inflation. There's a reason why the rich, the top 1% have gotten extremely wealthy and the poor have not during these last couple of years. And the reason why is because they own assets that go up with inflation. We have inflation that went up sky high. They own assets. It went up. The poor don't own any assets. And so when there's massive inflation, they don't, all they do is fall further behind because they're working for wages and those wages buy them less goods and services. So we need assets that go up with inflation. Now, what types of assets are those? Well, I'm glad you asked. Again, I'm going to have a special presentation. It's probably about an hour presentation where I'm going to dive deep into that and show you what I'm doing with my own money, what assets I'm buying and how I'm looking at this. And I'll go into Q and A. There's a link down below if you want to join me. That's going to be next week. Um, now, there's still some good stocks. Now, the growth stocks are obviously falling out of favor. They've been plummeting. There's no cash flow there. It's all speculation. They're doing all kinds of weird stuff. But what we saw, for example, in the pandemic, pandemic stocks like Zoom, for example, things that could be done from working from home did really well. And if we go back and look at other market crashes like 2008, we saw stocks like Walmart, Costco, things like that did really well. Why? <laughs> Well, people need to maximize their purchasing power and they need to go to those discount stores. And so those are the types of stocks that I would look at. Also, what I really like is cash flowing assets. Again, it's moving from growth to value. And so we want cash flowing assets. Those could be REITs. Those could be dividend paying stocks. I like real estate. You know that. Um, I just bought a ranch that uh, was part, part of the next five steps, but also it's an asset that goes up with inflation and it's cash flow at the same time. We'll go ahead and link a video to that. I just put out a video a couple days ago. You can see about that ranch right there. But cash flow and assets, those could be businesses, um, car washes. My, I have lots of friends that are buying car washes, laundromats, campgrounds, things like that. Those are things that no matter what the economy does, they're always going to be in demand. Recession proof cash flow and assets. The other thing that we need to do is we need to be voting with our money. A lot of us are not being uh, careful with that. And so the best vote that we can make is not at the polls. The best vote that we can make is with our money. That's why I left Puerto Rico um, in December, because they passed a mandate that I would not live under. No amount of economic advantage or tax savings would keep me there because I had to vote with my money. If, if I stayed there, I was telling them what they were doing was okay. And so I left. We need to vote with our money. We also, <laughs> if you haven't been slapped across the face and woken up yet, then you maybe never will. But did you see how Trudeau and Canada just seized 
about $15 million that was supposed to go to the truckers. Did you see how they just said that anybody that even goes there and participate is going to have their bank accounts frozen and seized? Did you see that? Did you see how the Biden administration just took seven and a half billion dollars from the Afghanistan people who had their money in the bank? Just took it. It's gone. No due process. No court order. It's just gone. So uh, I'm awake. Hopefully you're awake. I wouldn't want to be keeping my money in the bank. No more money in the bank that I'd be afford, uh, uh, allowed to lose or uh, willing to lose, I should say. They typically say, um, don't invest more than you're willing to lose. Well, don't keep more in the bank than you're willing to lose. Um, so we can get money out of the bank, gold, Bitcoin, and cash. Of course, Bitcoin is my favorite choice, no doubt. Uh, and even some cash. Now, I understand cash is inflating super bad, but it's important to have cash at this time. Uh, and then also we need to be refusing ESG narratives. ESG narratives is a way that they're trying to control the financial system. So these are some things we're going to do. Like I said, there's a link down below if you want to know more details, some actual names and, and percentages that I'm doing. Now, five steps to protecting yourself. We need to think um, longer term. This is not long term for me. Long term would be 10 to 20 years. But for most people, three to six years is pretty long term. Why three to six years? Well, in my research on my three revolutionary cycles that are converging right now, it's all happening around the 2024 to 2026 range. I believe that, I hate to break it to you, things are probably going to get worse for the next couple of years. But then they're going to get better. And I believe there's massive hope, massive prosperity on the other side. I'm excited about the world that my kids will live in once we get on the other side of this, but the next couple of years are going to be tough. So we need to get past this period. We need to be prepared to get past that 2025, 26 range. And so thinking long term, most people are caught up in the short term game right now. I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to trade options on Robinhood or trade cryptocurrencies. That is short term fiat money induced thinking. Think long term. You need to build local community. When I say local community, there's nothing more important than community. Having like-minded people around you that you can share ideas with. These are friends, but it's also businesses. So if the supply chains were broken down and your grocery store didn't have the you know, food that you wanted, where would you get it? Do you know local farmers? Do you know local ranchers? Can you get some meat? Can you get some eggs? Well, you should be building those relationships before you need them. We say, or I like to say that you would dig your well before you're thirsty. So what happens is if you wait until the shelves are already bare and you go try to find the butcher or the rancher, they're going to say, I don't know you and all my friends are coming in line first. So you should probably start building those relationships first. Also, like I said, the banks, the banks are a problem. Do not keep more money in the bank than you're willing to lose. Um, if you, anything, I would start going to credit unions and work with them. Um, also, food supplies and bullets. Stockpile some food. I mean, every time you go to Costco, every time you go to the grocery store, buy a little bit extra. Put those canned goods away. Even if you don't eat them, maybe they'll be useful for trade, barter, things like that. Other types of supplies that you might need. Um, I don't anticipate this Mad Max end of world scenario. I'm just going to tell you straight up. Um, I do believe in probabilities, not black and white certainties. So is there a possibility anywhere in the world? Is there, is there even a remote chance that supply chains could break down where you might not be able to get what you want from the grocery store, even for a period of time? Would you give that a 1% chance? Would you give it a 5% chance? I had it about a 10% chance. Now I'm up to about a 20, 25% chance. That's what I'm thinking. Some people that I uh, network with are more in the 75 to 90% chance. I don't think it's that high, but even if it's 25% like I'm saying, or 10% like you might be thinking, then maybe you should get 10% of the supplies that you need. Don't you think you should be acting on that? Okay, so that, uh, of course, bullets. Um, some of the things, the attributes that make money, a lot of people say, well, your Bitcoin won't be worth anything if society breaks down, if the internet goes down. Well, your ATM card won't work if the internet goes down either. And what we've seen is when um, societies break down, let's say Hurricane Katrina um, a number of years ago or down in Venezuela, people start trading real goods. They're trading water for batteries. They're trading laundry detergent, right? Things like that. And so money must have certain attributes to be considered money. It must be portable, divisible, durable, fungible, things like that. Bullets make that up. Uh, that might be something you want to do. And then most importantly, we want to increase our options. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty ahead. We don't know exactly how this is going to break down. We don't know how it's going to play out. We don't know how long it's going to take. So 
after Trump got elected, a lot of people said they were going to leave the United States because Trump became president and they were going to go to Canada. A lot of people have left oppressive countries like the Middle East and gone to Canada. And now they find themselves living under a dictator. So that didn't work out too well for them. Um, now, we might decide to go to Mexico today or somewhere else, but we don't know how that's going to work out either. So the more options we can give ourselves, optionality beats uncertainty. And so we want to have options. So I live in California. I got a ranch in Texas. I'm building a home down in Mexico. I got a community in El Salvador that I can plug in, plug in with, and I have more options, options of things I can trade, et cetera. All right, and then lastly, you got to be paying attention. This is not the time to be asleep at the wheel. Now, who are you paying attention to? Well, pay attention to the people who are making the policies. I showed you a video from um, the head of the BIS, the central bank above all central banks. Listen to what he's telling you. I showed you something from the head of the IMF. Listen to what she's showing you. Uh, we have Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum. <laughs> he's not just telling you, he's written three books. Have you read the books? So he says the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. That's his quote, not mine. This is not some made up conspiracy. He's, read, he's written a couple books. You should read them. He wrote, wrote a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset. Now, what's funny is probably below this video, there's probably like a disclaimer telling you that the, uh, that the Great Reset is just whatever, like they're trying to disclaim it. He wrote a book. Go read it. Listen to what he says in there. Of course, he got so much pushback on that. He just wrote a new book, and now it's called, not The Great Reset, it's called The Great Narrative. So now he's talking about how they can change the narrative. Again, read the book. Listen to what he says. Um, he wrote this book a number of years ago, and you should really go read this book. Where is it? You should really go read this book, because if I tell you what's in this book, you're going to say, Mark, you're a wacko. I'm never going to watch your videos again. So I'm not even going to tell you what's in the book. I just recommend that you read it. He wrote it. If you want to know where, what their plan is for the world and where it's going, then you should go read that book. Um, also, you need to watch alternative news. I'm sorry, I hate to tell you, but CNN and MSNBC, they're probably not telling you the truth. At best, I mean, or I should say at least, watch both sides and try to listen to both sides and then make up your own mind. Now, um, again, take them at their own word. Here's a video clip of Justin Trudeau I want to play this for you real quick because, like I said, take him at their word. Let's go ahead and play it. Even with Sun TV watching for any slip, he was asked which country he most admired and referred to China. There's a level of, of uh, admiration I actually have for China um, because their you know, basic dictatorship is allowing them uh, to actually turn their economy around on a dime and say, we need to go green as fast as we need to start... All right, so there you heard it in his own words, from his own mouth, he really respects China because it's a dictatorship. Think about that. So a lot of people are accusing him today of what's happening in Canada and him being a dictator. Why would they be surprised? Because he literally said that's who he respected, a dictatorship. And the last thing I would say is that uh, this is a warning. All right, this is a warning. And from one of my favorite authors, Ayn Rand, she says that you can, you can choose to ignore reality, but you cannot ignore the consequences of reality. An ostrich can bury its head in the sand, doesn't stop it from being eaten. And you can choose to ignore the warning, or you can choose to do something about it. We might only have a couple of months left, or maybe I'm being crazy. I don't know. But either way, I'm going to do a special one-hour presentation, show you exactly what I'm doing, what assets I'm buying, how I'm protecting myself, and not just to be protected, but to actually get ahead through this time. There's a link down below if you'd like to join me. We're going to do live Q&A afterwards. I hope to see you there. But let me know what you think down below. Do you think that it's possible they might try to really squeeze this off before the election? Do you think they'll wait till the central digital currency comes out, or am I just being crazy? Either way, leave me a comment and let me know. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. And if you don't like the video, it's okay. Give me a thumbs down. But at least leave me a comment and let me know why. And that's what I got for you today, all right? To your success.